Let's go to the Word of God. Today's passage is Mark chapter 13, verse 14 to 20. But when you see the abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to be, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down nor enter his house to take anything out. And let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that it may not happen in winter. For in those days there will be such tribulation as has not been from the beginning of the creation that God created until now and never will be. And if the Lord had not cut short the days, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the days. As you know, we're talking about Jesus' teaching concerning the end times. This entire chapter contains Jesus' teaching concerning the end times. Now, we also told you, I'm just reminding you certain things we've also told you in the last few weeks. We've also told you that this is not easy teaching. This is, a, there is some complexity to this. Why? Well, the whole subject itself is a bit complex, you must admit. The general subject of end times, or as it is called in theology, eschatology, you know, the theology concerning the last days, is not easy. There are complexities to it. There are things difficult to understand. And specifically, this teaching by Jesus here, known as the Olivet Discourse, because he's sitting on the Mount of Olives and teaching. This is known as the Olivet Discourse. This has its own complexities and challenges, mainly because the question that the disciples ask Jesus is a complex question, and Jesus' answer also is complex. What do I mean by that? Today, if we're asking a question about the end of the world, we'll simply say, well, you know, what are the signs of the end times? Or, you know, how do we know that the end is coming? Or, what is a good sign? And, and so on. It's a fairly simple question. But when they asked the question to Jesus, it was not a simple question because they were not only asking about the end of the world, they were also asking about the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. Just track with me here in case you missed what we've said earlier. I'm just trying to remind you certain things. They're combining two things and asking. They're saying, what are the signs associated with the temple destruction, which happened, by the way, in 70 AD. Now, this conversation between uh, the disciples and Jesus is happening in 30 AD. So, picture that. You picture yourself in 30 AD, right? Way back in history, this, that's when this uh, is this happening. For the first time, Jesus is teaching his disciples on the Mount of Olives, uh, overlooking the temple over there. And their question is, when will the temple be destroyed? And when will the end of the world be? What are the signs for both? It's a complex question. You have to appreciate the complexity of that. Then only you will appreciate the complexity of Jesus' answer. In Jesus' answer, which starts at verse 5 and goes all the way to the end of the chapter, he also seems to talk about both these things. <laughs> the temple destruction in 70 AD, as well as the signs of the end of the world. Now you may say, why are they combining the two things? Why are the disciples asking both together? Because I think the reasonable explanation is, in their mind, if the temple is destroyed, the end is coming very soon. It's all happening. It must happen one after the other. And to them, this must be followed by that. Temple destruction must be followed by end things, you know. Why? Because put yourself in their shoes. We're talking about the Jerusalem temple. We're talking about the Jewish temple, the most important structure there in the Jewish religion. If that has to be destroyed, there would have to be a massive attack on Jerusalem. Armies would have to attack the city of Jerusalem and raise Jerusalem to the ground. <laughs> then only the temple can be destroyed. You we're talking about all-out war. Unless that happens, Jerusalem temple cannot be destroyed. We're talking about all-out war where Israel is defeated, the Jewish people are defeated, their sacred city and temple is destroyed. Now, 
If that's going to happen, in the mind of the disciples, it looks like they're thinking, okay, if that's going to happen, if the worst destruction is going to come upon us, then we've got the Messiah sitting right in front of our eyes. They already believe Jesus is the Messiah. If the worst destruction is about to happen, then the Messiah is going to set right everything right after that. He's saying temple will be destroyed, which means Jerusalem will be destroyed. We'll lose in a very terrible defeat. But then Jesus, the Messiah, will set everything right and restore the kingdom back to Israel. And and that's their expectation. And so from the disciples' perspective, if temple will be destroyed, then soon the other things have to happen. Israel has to receive restoration and its prior glory and the promises have to come true. And it all has to happen one after the other. And so they bundle it all up into one question. When is the temple going to be destroyed? When is the end of the world? That question is in verse 4, Mark. 13 verse 4. Now if you look at Mark 13 4, you won't see it like that. That's because you have to take Mark 13 4 and then see the parallel Matthew 24 3. Keep it side by side in order to understand that question. Now, I went through all this in detail the second week we did Mark 13. So I don't want to go in detail. Just reminding you that their question is complex and therefore Jesus' answer is also complex. As I showed you in the second sermon on Mark 13, Jesus seems to blend both these elements. He seems to sometimes be talking about uh, 70 AD. Sometimes he seems to be talking about the end of the world. Sometimes it looks like, is he talking about both? Like, you know, hitting two birds with one stone kind of deal, right? That's a common feature in biblical prophecy, where you'll have a prophetic passage, Bible prophecy, which has more than one fulfillment, a near fulfillment and a far out fulfillment. And maybe Jesus is doing that here. It looks like certain passages, in fact, today's passage might be one such passage. So there is a complexity here. That's what I'm trying to say, which means we have to approach this with a little bit of humility. Right? (laughs) Yes. May God help us. We also need God's help (laughs) in understanding. Now look at the passage today we have. The, The passage that we have here today before us is verse 14 to verse 20, right? Now the question is, does this passage talk about 70 A.D.? Or is it talking about the end of the world? Jesus' words here are a prophecy about the future. The question is, is it about 70 AD, temple destruction by the Romans, or the end of the world, which still hasn't happened? You know, by the way, when I say end of the world, it means it sounds really pessimistic, doesn't it? Maybe we should come up with a different way to say it. It means the end of this world and the beginning of a new world for us. <laughs> So nothing to worry about if you belong to Jesus Christ, (laughs) right? So what is it talking about? It looks like it's talking about both because if you look at verse 14 to 18, it almost naturally feels like he's talking about 70 AD, at least some portions of it. For example, the end of verse 14, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. It looks like he's talking about a local thing that is happening in Judea. If you are in Judea, you flee to the mountains. Or uh, come down to verse uh, 18, for example. Pray that it may not happen in winter time. They say that during the winter, the wadis, the, the sort of valley-like troughs outside Jerusalem, if you were to run away you know, from Jerusalem, you would have to go past these wadis, which, which are dry during the summer, but filled with water during the winter, making it hard to cross commentators say that therefore that's probably why Jesus said pray that it may not happen in winter because it'll become almost impossible to cross you'll have so many extra natural obstacles trying to flee Jerusalem and so on that seems to apply more to 70 AD because if it's talking about the end of the world whether it's happening in winter or summer I don't think it's going to matter if you're talking about tribulation that's coming at the end it doesn't matter whether it's summer or winter It doesn't matter where you are, you know, the way the Bible speaks of end time tribulation is it will be kind of on a global scale everywhere and the season is not really going to matter that much. (laughs) So what I'm saying is from verse 14 to 18, it seems to naturally fit with a 70 AD fulfillment. But if you're reading 14 to 18, you're thinking, oh, this must be talking about 70 AD. Then you come to verse 19 
Then suddenly the field changes. For in those days, verse 19, there will be such tribulation as has not been from the beginning of the creation that God created until now and never will be. Now you're thinking this can't be 70 AD. He's saying there's never been tribulation like this and there never will be tribulation like this after this, which means this must be the end time tribulation which even other Bible passages talk about. And even verse 20 kind of confirms that direction. If the Lord had not cut short the days, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the days. If the Lord hadn't intervened, no human being would be saved, you know. Doesn't seem to be talking about something local. All I'm trying to say is if you read the verse a little carefully, it appears to me that it looks like it's talking about both 70 AD as well as end of the world. So what we're going to do is we're going to see how these words were fulfilled in 70 AD and we're also going to then next see how these words might be fulfilled at the end times. Okay, so we're going to see 70 AD fulfillment of these words and then end time fulfillment of these words. Right. Now before I jump into how it was fulfilled 70 AD, let me just give you the kind of outline. Uh, because there's so many details here in this passage, it's easier to follow a simple outline. If you look at verse 14 to 20, it seems seems to follow this simple three-step outline. When you see something terrible happening, the worst tribulation is going to follow, but God will preserve his people. If you read verse 14 to 20, and if I want to simplify it for you, it seems to break down into these three points basically when you see something terrible happening the worst tribulation will follow but god will preserve his people now let me just show you the outline in the passage when you see something terrible happening that's in verse 14 when you see the abomination of desolation standing where you ought not to be then you know so when you see this eh? That's how the passage begins. And then you go down to verse 19. In those days there will be such tribulation as has not been from the beginning of creation. So when this something terrible happens, this terrible tribulation will follow. And then you go down to verse 20. If the Lord had not cut short the days, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the days. Which tells me God acted for the preservation of his people. So it's a three-step outline, and let's use that to see how this uh, passage is fulfilled in 70 AD, and then let's talk about how it might be fulfilled in the end. 70 AD first. This is a remarkable prophecy. You have to appreciate this. You have to step back and appreciate it. 40 years before the temple is destroyed, Jesus predicts that it will be destroyed. Not one stone will be left one on top of the other. You may ask, why the complexity, right? Jesus only actually kind of took it in the complex direction. (laughs) You remember coming out of the temple, Mark 13, verse 1 and 2, eh? walking out of the temple, one disciple of Christ makes a passing comment at the beauty of the temple. He says, wow, what amazing stones, you know, what an amazing facade. And instead of just saying, yeah, amazing, right? Jesus goes, not one stone will be left on another. How's that to spoil your mood? Imagine what the guy would have felt if he's talking about Jerusalem temple, the Jewish temple, the most important structure. I mean, that would have stopped the disciples in their tracks. What? Not one stone will be left on another? And that's why they asked the question, what are the signs of the temple destruction and what are the signs of the end of the... So it's Jesus who kind of took it in that direction and it kind of goes in that direction, but it's an amazing prophecy of the future. Even if you take it as 70, 80 fulfillment, it's an amazing fulfillment. You have to stop and be amazed at the fact that Jesus predicted the Jewish temple destruction in 70, 80, 40 years before that ever happened. And it happened just like he said it'll happen. And he's in fact going to tell them in this passage, what are the signs of it happening? What is the sign? So let's begin to look at this, how this was fulfilled in 70 AD and how Jesus warns them with a sign. The first thing is when you see something terrible happening, right? That's in verse 14, as I said. The key word is that something terrible is the abomination of desolation. Verse 14, they say, is one of the most difficult verses to interpret. (laughs) The abomination of desolation. 
Now, what does that mean? Just look at those words. Just think about the words for a minute. That's the something terrible, the abomination of desolation. This is a phrase that Jesus picks up from the book of Daniel. If you read the King James Version or if you uh, look at Matthew's parallel, you'll see Jesus picks this up from Daniel. He's quoting Daniel. Daniel uses this phrase three times, 927, 1131, 1211. So Jesus speaks up something from Daniel and he quotes it here. Now what does that mean? The word abomination means something that is blasphemous, something that is horrible, something that is terrible. That's why I'm saying something terrible, right? And this abomination is an abomination that brings desolation. It's an abomination that is then followed by a desolation. It makes the entire place desolate. It devastates everything. It brings devastation and ruin and desolation. That's the basic meaning of the phrase. Now, let me tell you something that will help us understand this. When Jesus used the phrase in 30 AD, he's talking to these disciples. They're all Jews. Now, let's not forget that they're Jews. They're not Tamilians. We so often forget. (laughs) We think, you know, they were also like Tamil Christians or Indian Christians or whatever. No, they were Jews. (laughs) So, this was 30 AD, here's a bunch of Jews <laughs> talking. And when Jesus, also a Jew, uses the phrase abomination of desolation to his Jewish disciples, they would have picked up on it because, as far as the Jews in Jesus' day were concerned, the Daniel's prophecy regarding this abomination of desolation had already kind of been fulfilled before this time. Let me say that again. Daniel's prophecy, as far as the common Jews were concerned, had already found some level of fulfillment, at least a partial fulfillment, eh? already. You may say, when? 150 years ago, 150 years before Jesus' time, in 167 BC or 168 BC, an incident happened in Jerusalem at the temple itself. And this incident is written in the book of 1 uh, Maccabees. 1 Maccabees is a book written between Old Testament and New Testament. It's an intertestamental book. It's not in the Bible. It's not in our Bible, right? But it contains one incident where a pagan king by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes, a Seleucid king, comes and attacks Jerusalem and then goes into the temple erects an altar to Zeus, the Greek god, inside the Jewish temple. And then on top of the altar, in the Jewish temple, on the altar, he sacrifices a pig. Now, this is very blasphemous, as you can imagine. The, you know, pork meat is considered unclean, according to Jewish Old Testament law. And uh, this guy sacrifices a pig, and not only that, he then requires Jews to sacrifice to their pagan gods, and also requires Jews to eat pig meat. And then he goes on to persecute the Jews in and around Jerusalem. He gives the issues the death penalty for any child that is circumcised and its mother. Any baby that's circumcised is killed along with its mother. And death penalty for those who possess a copy of the book of the covenant. This is a major persecution against the Jews happening about 150 years before Jesus. Okay, This is found in other sources as well. Now why I said this is when 1 Maccabees records this incident, it uses that same phrase, abomination of desolation to describe what this guy did by going into the temple and desecrating it. (laughs) So they say that in the Jewish mindset, when you say abomination of desolation from Daniel, they're already thinking in terms of what happened 150 years ago when this incident happened. It resulted in terrible persecution of Jews, slaughter of great number of Jews, selling others into slavery, but then the Jews fought back. And that led to the famous Maccabean revolt under Judas Maccabeus. And uh, they won that, you know, the Jews fought back and they won. In just three years, they won. And then they had a period of almost 100 years of relative peace. (laughs) 
the Hasmonean dynasty and so on. So the point to notice is, so before Jesus uses these words, Daniel used it first. But then Maccabees, this book, which is not in the Bible, uses it. But the incident is well known among all Jews by the time Jesus comes. And so they're probably thinking of that as the abomination of desolation. At least they're thinking, you know, oh, there was one fulfillment of that. You see what I mean? There was one fulfillment of that. So now Jesus takes what Daniel said, what the Jews have experienced at least partially 150 years ago, and he says, when you see the abomination of desolation, which means he's saying it's going to happen again. Something like this is going to happen again. Did it happen in 70 AD? Yes. Did something like this happen in 70 AD? Was there a desecration of the temple like this? Yes, there was. In 70 AD, see the Jewish war begins in about 66 and then uh, escalates, escalates. And then, you know, in 70 AD, these guys and the Romans uh, finally enter Jerusalem and they go to the temple and they desecrate it. How? In several ways. One is they carry one of their military standards, that big banner, you know, which they have. And on the banner is an image of the emperor and the Roman soldiers worship it, it seems, or at least pay homage to it. And the banner itself, that standard, that military standard, that banner itself is considered idolatrous among the Jews. And these guys take the military standard right into the temple. So there's a desecration. Not only that, at the height of the destruction, just before the Roman general issues the order to burn the temple to the ground, they're about to burn it. The Roman army general, Titus, very famous, he's, you can read about in other sources as well. Before he issues the order to burn the temple, he goes into the temple, walks right into the holy place, the most holy place, the place that is forbidden except for the high priest to enter once a yeah, this army general Titus walks right into that, has a good look around, comes out, orders it to be burnt. <laughs> Old Testament clearly says you cannot go into the most holy place. You may say, why nothing happened to him? I thought if somebody goes in the most holy place, they'll drop down dead. Why didn't anything happen to him? Well, one simple answer is... When Jesus died on the cross, we read in the Gospels that the curtain of the most holy place was rent into two, was torn into two, signaling that the most holy place is no longer the same. It's different now. Things are different now. God's presence does not reside in it just as it did before. There is a difference now that Jesus has died and is going to rise again and so on. So I can give more explanations, but that's why nothing happened to him. But, but the, what you have to note that in 70 AD, there was a major desecration of the Jewish temple, which is what Jesus appears to be saying in that verse. When you see the abomination of desolation standing, what follows next? When you see this terrible thing happening, the worst tribulation follows. The worst tribulation follows, and that's what happened in 70 AD. Before the Romans entered Jerusalem itself, trouble started. They surrounded Jerusalem. They laid siege for years. For a few years, they just, you know, imposed a blockade, cut off the food supply, starved the city, basically, to the point where Josephus, the Jewish historian, writes, uh, that uh, at one point, the shortage of food became so severe that mothers in Jerusalem, some mothers in Jerusalem actually killed their own children, babies, and ate them, resorted to cannibalism. Things like this have happened in the Old Testament period itself. Very terrible. Before the Romans entered itself, they made the people of Jerusalem suffer like crazy. Not only shortage of food, you know. A moment like something like this happens, first of all, internal turmoil begins. <laughs> and that's what happened. Before the Romans entered Jerusalem, the Jews started fighting each other. Because you have an existing leadership, and suddenly you have these uh, other extremist guys who think they know better, you know. Uh, they were known as the zealots. <laughs> 
they come up and they say no this is not how you fight the romans we'll tell you how you fight the romans there's a disagreement between the zealots and the existing temple leadership and the zealots end up murdering the priests before the romans come in itself they murder the priests in the temple and they take over the city and and it comes to a point where they tell the public if you try to flee jerusalem will kill you you stay here and fight with us you know these are extremist guys who want to fight to the death against the romans never give up and then finally the romans do come in and after that it's the worst they slaughter the slaughter of jews in 70 ad was terrible people only know most of the time the hitler's slaughter of the jews in the holocaust 6 million jews in 70 ad more than 1 million jews are said to have been slaughtered by the romans that's a big number proportionately in 70 ad if you look at the total population of the jews that is a very big number <laughs> and in terms of atrocity committed they were equal or greater than hitler if you look at the atrocities the level of you know terror not that hitler was much better i mean these are all pretty bad cases really <laughs> what i'm saying is <laughs> forget about 70 ad and they only talk about you know holocaust probably it's because it's more recent but this was a terrible tribulation that's the second thing and it happened just like jesus said there was a terrible tribulation but then thirdly but god will preserve his people that's the third point right but god will preserve his people and i want to tell you how he preserved his people how did god preserve his people number one by telling them to flee by telling them to flee jerusalem look look at verse 14 he says when you see this terrible thing happening when you see the abomination of desolation standing where you ought not to be let the reader understand then let those who are in judea flee to the mountains <laughs> this is not just a prophecy this is a warning to flee it's a, it's saying if when you see this run run for your lives you know and he's saying if you read mark 13 right verse 14 there is that little note did you notice that let the reader understand yeah what does that mean that's like an insert from mark <laughs> that is something that the original audience of mark would have understood we may find hard to understand but the original audience who's the original audience of mark not us the you know when mark actually wrote it and, and sent the uh, gospel to that first audience they would have understood they say and that's why it's like in a almost like a cryptic form let the reader understand you have to remember this is a roman empire this is a roman world those are the guys in charge though they are ruling the roost you know in that world mark is writing when you see this happen and they say that mark's gospel was written sometime before 70 ad sometime before 70 ad maybe a decade before or something like that and there may have been early signs of conflict with rome conflict between rome and jerusalem so it's like a, almost like a code language which the original audience would have understood when you see the abomination of desolation standing where you ought not to be let the reader understand if you take it as applying to 70 ad they say they would have understood well in luke 21 just look at luke 21 it's more plain there eh? for our purposes it's very plain in luke 21 20 the same thing reported in luke is very plain you can see the warning more clearly when you see jerusalem surrounded by armies then you know that its desolation is near huh? how clear is this when you see jerusalem surrounded by armies then you know its destruction is near let them who are in judea flee to the mountains at that time then let them who are in judea flee huh? this is a clear warning isn't it by warning them jesus is actually saving them now listen carefully is commanding them to flee now you have to realize what a different strategy this is to the prevailing strategy at the time in those days when there was a war the safest place to be is in a fortified city a fortified walled city like jerusalem <laughs> If there was a war people outside fortified cities would go into fortified cities people inside fortified cities would not leave the city because you had a not a compound wall a city wall you had a fortress essentially and then you had maybe some a fighting army ready to defend itself the safest place to be is inside the fortified city 
Jesus says, get out of it. Flee. Look at Luke. Continue to read 21. You'll see it. it's very clear in Luke. Luke 21, 21. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains and let those who are inside the city depart. And let not those who are out of the country enter it. He's saying if you're inside the city, get out. If you're outside of the country, don't enter the city. This is exact reverse of what people would say in those days, it seems. They would say if you're outside, get in. And if you're inside, don't get out. Jesus is saying if you're outside in the country, don't go into Jerusalem. And if you're inside in Jerusalem, get out fast. <laughs> it's the opposite strategy. Not only that, the Jews had great faith in Jerusalem. <laughs> the Jews had great faith in Jerusalem. Not only faith in God, but faith in Jerusalem. <laughs> faith in the temple. You know, they're thinking this is the city of God. There's no way God will, uh, you know, let his city be destroyed. Let his temple be destroyed. This is God's city. This is where God's presence dwells. And so the safest place, according to the Jews especially, would be Jerusalem. Right next to the temple. It goes against general military strategy. It goes against the specific expectation of the Jews. But Jesus says, forget about Jerusalem. Get out. Don't stay there thinking it's the city of God or the temple is there. Flee. Go. Out. You know how many lives would have been saved by this command? I'll tell you later. I'll tell you later that there are indications that people actually followed what Jesus said. Jesus' counsel goes directly against the counsel of the prevailing world experts. But he tells them to flee. Not only that, he preserves them by stressing that they should flee urgently. That's the point of verse 15 and 16. Uh, flee urgently. Don't just flee. Don't delay the fleeing. Let the one who is on the house stop not go down nor enter his house to take anything out. If you're on the roof, the flat roof, the houses of the Jews at the time, you know, the staircase was on the outside of the house. He's saying if you're on the roof, don't go back into the house. Get out through the staircase and go. <laughs> and uh, 16 says, don't take anything from your house, he's saying. Don't go into the house to take anything. Think of that. No matter how much danger we are in, I feel like most of us would go in and try to get our wallet or, uh, you know, the phone we always have. I think even if we go to the rooftop, we'll have the phone. But uh, surely we won't flee without the phone. You know what I mean? Or some of us may have a list, like an emergency list. If I got to flee, I got to take this and go. I don't care how dangerous the situation is. You know, Jesus is saying, I don't care how important it is. If you're on the rooftop, don't get in, just go. Don't take anything. The point is, flee urgently. This is not a matter to play with, to delay. Verse 16 says, let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. The ones in the field will work without the outer garment, you know, because it's easier to work that way. But in the night, you need the outer garment. If you're traveling, you need the outer garment. And Jesus is saying, don't take it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you need it, but don't take it because this is a matter of life and death. As soon as you hear the news that something terrible is happening, there are signs, you flee. You know how many lives would have been saved because of this instruction by Jesus? Another way he saves their lives is by telling them to pray in verse 18. Look at verse 18. Pray that it may not happen in winter. Pray that it won't happen in winter. And you know, one commentator says, generally, his comments are reliable. <laughs> he says that uh, if you look at the time frame of when the fleeing happens... It happens in the summertime, he says. Historically, it actually happened in the summer. Jesus said here, pray that it will not happen in winter. And it turned out it happened in the summer. Now you may say, why did Jesus say that? He could have just made it happen in the winter. No. Yeah, he could have, I suppose. <laughs> he could have, but he says, no, pray. You pray and let it happen like that. That's how God works. You pray and let it happen like that. We'll say, well, why can't God just do it like that? No. God says, you pray and I will do it like that. But why not? Well, who are we to question God? If he says pray, just pray. Right? 
prayer really changes things. <laughs> what could have happened in the winter happened in the summer. God did it through their prayers. Yeah? See, these are all so many lessons here. <laughs> Instead of questioning God, if we would just do what he says, we will escape death itself. We will escape not only death, we will escape so many other things. <laughs> it's what happened in their case. Another way God preserved them is by shortening the days. That's very important. Verse 20, if the Lord had not cut short the days, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the days. If God had allowed it to go longer, more people would have died. But it is the mercy and the grace of God that God shortened the days. He did it for the sake of his people. Who are his people? Well, you can take it as his people, the Jews. But you should also take it as his people, the followers of Christ. And there were Christians living in Jerusalem. Let me tell you what actually happened. Jewish historian Josephus reports that uh, many Jews actually entered Jerusalem from the outside thinking it will be safe. And that's why it ended up being so populated. Because usually there's not one million Jews found there. What happened is many Jews even outside entered Jerusalem thinking it's the safest place to be. And the Jews in Jerusalem, many of them remained in Jerusalem thinking it's the safest place to be. But that's what Josephus, the historian, reports. The Christian historian, Eusebius, he reports, church historian Eusebius reports that Christians, the church in Jerusalem, Christians in Jerusalem received a divine revelation and fled the city and went to a region called Perea beyond the Jordan. And there they dwelt until all these things transpired. He says there was a big group of Christians who were living in Jerusalem, received a divine revelation and fled the city, went off into this you know, little far out place waited for these things to finish. Now, he doesn't say where, he got, where they got the divine revelation or how they got it, but I think this must have something to do with it. <laughs> divine revelation, how? I can just imagine the conversation in Jerusalem, you know, when the signs are happening, you know, when the Roman army is about to come to Jerusalem, when they hear the news that the Roman army is going to come to Jerusalem, and here you have these extremist zealots in Jerusalem saying, oh, Jerusalem will never fall, you know. And the Jews in that city saying, oh, we've got the temple, we've got the living God. You know, this is Jerusalem, this is the city of God. And then I can imagine another Christian saying, well, but Jesus told us to flee. Jesus said, flee. Then I can imagine another Christian saying, but nobody flees the fortified city, man. But then I can imagine this Christian saying, but Jesus told us to flee, man. Who knows better, you or Jesus? Who knows better, this entire city or Jesus? Lacks of people or Jesus? <laughs> I can just imagine these Christians fleeing Jerusalem only because Jesus told them to flee. Because it goes against the prevailing wisdom of the world. <laughs> the general wisdom of the world and the specific wisdom of the Jews. And they fled and they were safe for it. Amazing incident to me. It's an amazing example of how God preserves his people by giving them instructions that will result in their preservation. It's an amazing incident where I see God's care for his people, how much Jesus cares for his people. Look at verse 17. Huh? Even there I see his care for women, alas, woe for women who are pregnant and those who are nursing infants. He's thinking about how hard it's going to be for pregnant women and nursing mothers to flee. <laughs> That's Jesus. <laughs> He's thinking, my goodness, for, no matter what time it happens, there will be somebody pregnant. There will be somebody nursing a little baby. How hard it will be for them too. What I'm trying to say is look at the concern of Jesus. He teaches these people in a way that will save their lives. Literally, he saved through this teaching many, many Christians' lives in Jerusalem were saved. God preserves his people. You should see Jesus in all this. You can trust him. Whether you understand what he's saying or not, just do it. 
as one brand puts it, just do it. You don't have to understand it. Just do it. Right? After doing only, you'll understand. In this case, after they fled only, they would have understood, oh my goodness, who ever thought this could happen? The world says, you know, just do whatever you want. <laughs> uh, just follow your dream, you know. Well, no, first of all, do what he says. Do what he says. <laughs> yeah, sometimes it looks like, you know, the Bible, you know, the things it tells us looks like it's restricting our freedom and all that, right? Oh, don't do this, do this. And, and we think, oh my goodness, what a restrictive lifestyle or whatever. No, no, no. Anything that God tells us to do or not do is for our good. You do it, you will understand why it's good. You sit there and say, oh, how can this be? You know, why is this the case? You'll never get it. You'll understand the will of God the more you do it. The more you do it, the more you will understand and it will result in your good. Eh? So that's 70, 80 for you. Now that was easy, wasn't it? Trust me, that's easy. To talk about how prophecy has been fulfilled in the past is easy. But then now we're going to talk about how prophecy is going to be fulfilled in the future. Now that's hard. Why? It's easier after things happen to say, that's what it means. Right? Isaiah 53, famous prophetic passage in the Bible, right? If you had gone to Isaiah 53 before the cross ever happened, would you have understood it? <laughs> You would have been like, what, what is it talking about, you know? Like that Ethiopian. Who is it talking about, he said in Acts chapter 8. <laughs> Even after the cross, somebody had to explain it to him. But if you go to Isaiah 53 after the cross, then it makes a whole lot of sense. That's the nature of biblical prophecy. Not every time, but at least some of the time. You know, it's hard to understand prophecy regarding the future fully and completely and exhaustively. Sometimes you have to be content with a kind of a, a broad knowledge, an imperfect knowledge. Sometimes you don't have to settle for that. Sometimes there's enough to give you a very good idea. And sometimes we don't know enough. Like I don't, may not know enough. <laughs> I may leave out some of the gaps. So, bear with me. After all, I'm a beginner in this. So, let's get into this now. How this prophecy is fulfilled in the future. Okay? How this prophecy is fulfilled in the future. Same outline. When you see something terrible happening, the worst tribulation will follow, but God will preserve his people. When you see what terrible thing happening, the abomination of desolation. Many commentators who look at this say that... Uh, this cannot be exhaustively fulfilled in uh, 70 AD. This has to refer also to the end times. And, uh, okay, what terrible thing then will happen in the end? When you see this terrible thing in the end, what terrible thing will happen in the end? Now we're talking about end times, okay? So perk up, now, you know, it's more interesting for you probably. Eh? Three things I want to mention. One, armies encircling Jerusalem. Luke says, when the armies surround Jerusalem, right? Armies encircling Jerusalem. Question is, does the Bible have passages where it seems to suggest that armies or, or nations in, in the end, sometime during the end, will surround Israel and Jerusalem and attack it? Do we find passages like that in the Bible? And I would have to say, yes, there are passages like that in the Bible. For example, Ezekiel 38, 39, Zechariah 14, Revelation 16. We have passages that talk about how nations will surround Israel and attack Israel and Jerusalem and so on. Now, there's a group of Christians who interpret it literally. And there's a group also of Christians who interpret it symbolically, metaphorically, whatever. Now, my thing is, even if it happened literally, I wouldn't be surprised, would you? Would you be surprised if armies surrounded Jerusalem? I mean, if you've been following the news from October of last year, the news regarding Israel, that's no surprise at all. You'd be like, yeah, I thought so, you know. <laughs> 
right? I'm not saying it'll happen soon or anything like that. I'm just saying you wouldn't be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised. I don't think you would. Anybody following the news would not really be surprised if uh, nations attack Israel. Yeah, disappointed maybe, not surprised. Not totally unexpected. No. Because it seems like that's one. Just I'm talking just if you look at the news, it seems like a real possibility. Let alone look at Bible prophecy. <laughs> There's one thing that Jesus seems to hint at. Armies encircling Jerusalem, which are taught in more detail in other passages. Secondly, some kind of desecration or blasphemy or sacrilege happening in the temple. Now we're talking about end times here. Okay, Some kind of desecration or sacrilege or uh, blasphemy happening in the temple temple does the bible have passages that suggest that some kind of uh, terrible thing will happen in the temple in the end times and i would have to say yes it appears that the bible does have passages like that for example daniel 9:27 second thessalonians 2:4 uh, the chapters in ezekiel after 40 are also taken in that way sometimes now again there may be people who interpret this literally and there may be others who say, well, we can take it spiritually um, or metaphorically or in other ways. Um, but even if that were to happen, well, now this is actually a little more difficult case. <laughs> I wouldn't be shocked because it's Bible prophecy, but looking at the news, you would have to say it's hard for, hard for something like that to happen. Why? Because there is no temple right now in Jerusalem. Right now, there is no Jewish temple. The Romans leveled it to the ground. And ever since, there has never been a Jewish temple on that site. And so for it to be literally fulfilled, a temple would have to be rebuilt. Or some others would say, well, it doesn't need a literal fulfillment. You know, in some other way, something terrible will happen in the temple, whatever that means. Now, I don't want to go into that, but what I'm saying is, with the way God fulfills things, I wouldn't be surprised even if it happened, literally, because I believe in Bible prophecy, you know, and the power of God to fulfill things. But if you watch the news, that would be a shock. <laughs> so we talk, talked about the, uh, some kind of terrible thing happening in the temple. Now, this is talked about, like, for example, even Paul uses that kind of language in 2 Thessalonians. He says, the man of lawlessness will take his seat in the temple. <laughs> what does he mean by that? Uh, these are not easy passages to interpret, but, but he says that, you know. So, armies surrounding Jerusalem, something terrible happening in the temple. Thirdly, Antichrist. Even the Antichrist seems to be hinted at here in Mark 13, verse 14. You may say, What? I don't see anything about Antichrist. Well, look again. And if you're looking at, say, King James or New King James, you wouldn't see this. Uh, but if you're looking at the ESV or the, some of the modern translations, you will see it. Now, when we read it closely, now this time, listen. When you see the abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to be. Now, you would imagine it, you would think it would say where it not it ought not to be, right? When you see the abomination of desolation, abomination of desolation sounds like something. Maybe an idol or something like that, whatever, right? But then, my translation says, where he ought not to be. When you see the abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to be. That's the original Greek. It has a he there. Very strange. People find that very strange. Where, what? Is it a thing or a person? And suddenly, you know, the beginning seems like a thing, and then it says he making it look like it's a person. And then you have these enigmatic words, let the reader understand. And one of the explanations for let the reader understand is, it's a note to the one doing public reading of scripture in those days, saying, don't change the he. <laughs> now, see, today most of you have Bibles in your laps, or Bibles on your phones. In those days, they didn't have it like that. 2,000 years ago, they did public reading of scripture. They heard the word of God only when they came together as a church and gathered together like this. And someone, a specialist, would read the scriptures. Not everybody could do that. And they were specialists in, 
publicly reading the scriptures. And so they say that one of the explanations for that, let the reader understand is when they're reading this, when you see the abomination of desolation and they're thinking it's a thing, you know, the reader is thinking this is something, you know, when you see the abomination of desolation standing where it not to be, they would naturally correct it, thinking it's a mistake. But then that's why you have that little note to the public reader saying, oh, let the reader understand we have done this on purpose. It's not a grammatical mistake. Just read it like it is. <laughs> Keep going. Yeah. Anyway, I know it's hard to see it, but in other passages we have Antichrist spoken about, right? Antichrist. Who's the Antichrist? Someone in the end times who will oppose Christ and his people and his purposes and even show himself to be God, put himself in the place of God and blaspheme God. Yeah. That's who the Antichrist is, and well, there's a lot more to that. There are many passages that teach about Antichrist. 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, 2, 10 teaches. Paul teaches there. He calls him the man of lawlessness, the son of perdition, meaning son of perdition is a title also used to refer to Judas. The Judas, the one who betrayed Jesus. The Antichrist, Judas is a little bit of a type of that. <laughs> How? In the beginning, people will think the Antichrist is a good person. They'll be caught off guard by the deception. They'll trust him. They'll think he's a good person, but then he will deceive. He's, uh, Paul teaches Revelation 13, talks about the beast, and that's generally taken like that. So anyway, Mark 13, therefore, seems to teach this kind of an order in end times. Antichrist reveals himself and then uh, tribulation that is uh, terrible tribulation great tribulation follows and then Jesus comes in in glory Mark 13 seems to hint at that order right if Mark 13 14 is Antichrist verse 19 is tri tribulation verse 26 uh, and 27 is the glorious coming of Jesus the same order is taught in other passages as well uh, Revelation for example 13 Revelation 13 Antichrist and then tribulation and then chapter 19 is the glorious uh, um, coming of Jesus and so on. I'm just trying to say th these things seem to be hinted at by Jesus later developed in the scriptures. So we got three things here. What three things? Uh, Jerusalem encircled by other uh, uh, enemies. Uh, something terrible happening in the temple. Antichrist revealing himself. If you see these three things, <laughs> we are headed to the end. <laughs> What's going to come next is terrible tribulation. If you see these three things, what's going to come next is the worst tribulation. When you see these terrible things happening, what's going to come next is the worst tribulation. That's described in Mark in verse 19, right? In those days, there will be such tribulation as has not been from the beginning of the creation that God created until now and never will be. It's never The world has never seen tribulation like this and never will see anything like this. This is the worst that can ever be. So 70 AD was terrible. This is in some way going to be worse. <laughs> if you ask me in what way it's going to be worse, I don't think the answer is just uh, intensity. I think... The answer also has to do with uh, scope. It will be global in scope. Global in scope. Eh? 70 AD was a local matter happening in and around Jerusalem. But uh, end time tribulation will be global in scope based on certain passages of the Bible. So it's greater in scope, greater perhaps in intensity. Worst tribulation. You can only imagine what kind of things will happen. There are some, some teaching about this in the book of Revelation, which um, I don't want to get into now, but you know, you can go read some of the terrible things that, that are mentioned there. Um, but we have to move on to the third point. Even though the worst tribulation will follow, God will preserve his people. God will preserve his people. God will preserve his people. Verse 20, if the Lord had not cut short the days, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the days. He shortened the days. He intervened. If not for his intervention, no human being would be saved. That's how terrible these times will be. But because of his intervention, his people will be saved. His people would be preserved. 
There are many passages which teach this simple truth that in the end time you have the worst tribulation, but God will preserve his people. Eh? Not only Mark 13, you can see this. For example, let me read one example passage, Daniel 12, 1. In the end times, there'll be the worst tribulation, but God will preserve his people. Daniel 12, 1. At that time shall arise Michael, the great prince who has charge of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never has been since there was a nation till that time. <laughs> is a convoluted way of saying the worst. <laughs> at that time, there will be the worst tribulation. But at that time, continue, your people shall be delivered, everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. So there will be the worst tribulation, but at that time, your people will be delivered, everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. There are many passages like this. So these, as terrible as this sounds, this worst end time tribulation, we don't have to be afraid of it because in principle God <laughs> preserves his people no matter how bad that is you may say what about this antichrist thing that scares me you know my goodness uh, no don't be scared by the antichrist you know Paul talks about his end in 2nd Thessalonians 2 8 he says the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming that's a glorious verse. <laughs> if you think Antichrist is very powerful, when Jesus comes, Jesus will kill him, it seems. And the way he does it is what is astounding to me. The Lord Jesus will kill him with the breath of his mouth. It sounds like Jesus comes, and if he just goes, that's it. It shows the, the glory of the Lord Jesus. Don't, don't be scared by tribulation and antichrist and uh, nations attacking Israel and all these things. No, no, no. Want to go? If you want to find out what happens to um, armies which encircle Jerusalem and all that, go read Zechariah 14. <laughs> In the end, I'm talking about the way it'll end. Is uh, the Lord will come and his feet will rest on Mount Olives and that mountain will be split in two and there will be a massive victory is how it goes, you know. So there's nothing to fear, you know. There's nothing to fear. And that's why Jesus very coolly sitting on the Mount of Olives, he goes, you know, well, you know, this terrible thing will happen and then the worst tribulation will happen and then I'll come, <laughs> you know. Which means trust me. Look to me, not to the Antichrist. <laughs> Let not your eyes and your focus wander to these other signs, the Antichrist and the other news about Israel and all this. You know, that's fine, but your eyes should be on Christ far above and beyond all these things. Otherwise, you'll just get scared, you know. Nothing to be scared about because God preserves his people. Okay, now how are we to... Uh, let's assess the current state. 2024, here we are in the month of February. How are we to process this? <laughs> Has verse 14 happened? <laughs> Let me be direct. <laughs> Has verse 14 happened? Well, if you ask me, like I said, if the verse is hinting at uh, three things, especially that antichrist thing, which not only this, I mean, here there's a subtle hint, but if you look at, for example, 2 Thessalonians 3, it's very clear. Uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, because the people in, in Thessalonica are confused whether the day of the Lord has already come. Paul says in verse 3, let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of perdition who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. These people are confused whether the day has already come. Paul is saying no, because before it comes, Antichrist, or what he calls him, the man of lawlessness, must come and reveal himself. Then only that will come. Therefore, if you ask me if Mark 13, 14 is fulfilled, I will say no. <laughs> the Antichrist has not revealed himself. At least that much, I think I can say. Even... If you say he's somewhere out there, he has not revealed himself is what I would say. And I would say that if you see those kind of 
things happening, then you have a better indication that we are, we are closer to that. Eh? But right now, we are, I'm saying this to say, also, next question. Are we in the great tribulation now? <laughs> I don't mm -hmm. think so, because the order seems to be, this has to happen, Antichrist has to reveal himself, then only the worst tribulation will follow. Right? So if you take it like that, we are not in the great tribulation now. Now, I know some Christians have differing opinions on this, but that's, that seems to be a simple understanding based on just even Mark 13 itself. This order seems to be clear. When you see this, then this will happen, then this will happen. So it seems to me like uh, we don't have the Antichrist yet, or we don't have him revealed. We don't have verse 14, 14 fulfilled. Therefore, we don't have verse 19 fulfilled. We're not in the great tribulation. Now it appears to be. So then, what if that happens? And what if these things proceed in that direction? What if the Antichrist is revealed, which would mean then... Uh, uh, I'm talking about future, in the future, uh, months and years, whatever. If this turns out like this, if, what I mean is, if in our lifetime, let me put it like that, if in our lifetime the Antichrist is revealed, which means the next is the great tribulation, uh, what is our hope? I think most of us would say that our hope is we would be raptured before this severe tribulation. I think most of us would, I don't know if you've heard that kind of teaching, but most of us would probably say that we would be raptured before this most severe tribulation, this worst tribulation in the end, and therefore we don't have to, in that sense, worry about this terrible end time great tribulation. I think most of us would probably say that. Now the word rapture does not mean uh, mainly uh, we are raptured or rapturous or you know uh, delighted or something like that. The idea is we will be caught up with the Lord in the air as 1 Thessalonians 4 16 and 17 says. If you look at 1 Thessalonians 4 16 and 17 it's a famous passage but that's where that's one of the main passages for Rapture, basically. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, then we who are alive, will, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. It's that catching up in, to, in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air that is referred to as rapture. Yeah. So, what I'm saying is, if I say to you, well, what if this happens in your lifetime? What if Antichrist reveals himself, which means next comes the great tribulation? Do we worry about this? I think most of us would say, well, we would be raptured. That means the church, the living church of the Lord Jesus, that is believers, would be raptured before the severe tribulation. Now, there is some disagreement as to when exactly the rapture will take place. The rapture takes place, but there is some disagreement amongst Christians, even somewhat like-minded Christians, as to when exactly the rapture will take place. So there are some people who say the rapture will take place before any of the great, the, that final tribulation period. Before it, so that you won't go through one ounce of it, you know. There are some others who say you will go through a little bit and then you'll be, you know, raptured. There are some who say you'll go through about half of it and about midway, you know, uh, then you'll be raptured out of it and uh, so on. You, you get the point. And all of them will show verses to support their view. So if you say, here's a verse, they'll say, oh, you got a verse, I got a verse. Let's go, come on. You know. So I don't want to play that game. <laughs> what I want to say is, Let's stick to what is clear. Even if we are raptured before the slightest part of that final tribulation, okay? Even if we are raptured before that final tribulation. How should we apply this today? How should we live in light of this truth today? We have heard these things today. We say we have the hope of the rapture 
that uh, God will preserve his people specifically with respect to great tribulation by rapturing the church before the severe tribulation. We say all this, but then how do we actually approach our day-to-day -day life in light of this hope is my question. That's a very important question. How do we live in light of this hope? Let me begin by how we should not live. <laughs> I've heard of people some years back. It seems that uh, I think it was after 1948 when Israel became a nation, which is a huge development in the history of the world, in eschatology, in everything. <laughs> I mean, it's one of the modern day miracles that Israel became a nation in 1948, but it's not shocking because God is there, of course. <laughs> and, you know, but one of the things that happened after that is there was a, a frenzy, an excitement. Wow, Israel has become a nation. We are headed to the end times and Jesus will rapture the church out. And, and, and then people even started setting dates, you know. Here's the date of the rapture. And the, the teaching, you know, people focused on this, you know, end times and rapture and all this and followed the uh, formation of the state of Israel and so on. And what one of the things that happened in our country, I've heard of places in Tamil Nadu even, where people left their jobs, resigned their jobs, and just said, what's the point of going to work? Israel's become a nation, everything is heading to the end times, all the signs are there, Jesus will rapture us out anytime. It's gonna happen anytime, no point going to work. No point sending, they even stopped their children from going to school. Think about this, it happened. Now do we live like that? Do we call that, that's our blessed hope, you know. Wow, we got, we got our mind fixed on uh, meeting Jesus and being raptured out. We're so heavenly minded. Stop going to school, stop going to work. We sit at home, wait for Jesus to rapture us out. No, clearly, you know, you know that's not right, right? And interestingly, in the Bible, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, there is something similar happening. The, the, the Christians in Thess Thessalonica are idle, it seems. If you read that, Paul is blasting them for being idle. If you read that, you get the feel like he's blasting them. You lazy fellows, you know, sitting at home, not going to work and trying to eat. Haven't you seen our example? Even I work. Even though I'm a preacher, I work. Doing other things as well. And I eat new people are sitting at home and trying to eat without going to work. You read 2 Thessalonians 3 at home, it's almost like he's blasting them. 2 Thessalonians 2 is about how Paul is saying, the time has not yet come. You guys think it's come, but it's not yet come. That you're wrong because the Antichrist has to come first. These things have to happen. So commentators writing about 2 Thessalonians say, most likely what happened is, these people got into a kind of a, you know, uh, sit back and wait for the coming of the Lord mode, thinking it's time. Why go to work? Let's sit and eat, you know. <laughs> and Paul says, no. No, go to work. Nobody should eat without going to work, he says. <laughs> he kind of scolds them into going to. Well, that's not the approach. That's a wrong approach. You don't become lazy because of the hope of the rapture. <laughs> no, if anything, you got to work harder. You have the gospel to preach. You have so many things to do. Like last week we saw, one of the most important things God has left us here on this earth is to proclaim the gospel to the ends of the earth. So that's a wrong approach. That's, we should not approach it like that. I'll tell you another way we should not approach it. In China, Christianity comes in through Hudson Taylor and the missionaries in the 1800s in China. And it, the gospel is proclaimed, you know, and there's a big growth of Christians and more and more become believers. And then there's a period of persecution, 1900. Severe, terrible persecution. And then they come out of it, and there's a peaceful period, and then you, you have a big, long, peaceful period. Excuse me. And then there are some early signs that there may be persecution again. This is maybe, maybe in the 40s or so, you know. There's some early signs that China could be heading in the direction of severe persecution against Christians. And at that moment, what is simultaneously happening is, you know, Israel becomes a nation in 1948. 
all these things are happening simultaneously. Also in China, the preachers from America and the West are preaching about end times as well, teaching them about end times as well, teaching them about rapture as well. And uh, for some reason, what happened is a Chinese bishop later comments on this. In that time period, say around the 30s and the 40s and the 50s maybe, where there are signs by 40s and you know, early 50s surely, there, where there are signs that the persecution may be headed for Christians. Preachers are faced with a choice, right? What do you preach? Now, what they do, according to this Chinese bishop who comments later, he says that they, a lot of them ended up preaching this way, saying, don't worry about any persecution. Jesus will rapture us out before that. And they seem to have gotten that idea from, we'll be raptured out before great tribulation. Great tribulation is great for a reason. <laughs> you know what I mean? There's been tribulation for the last 2,000 years. There's a reason we call end time tribulation as great tribulation. There's a difference, right? Huh? There has been terrible tribulation even for the last two. Think of the Romans killing, slaughtering Christians, burning them alive. Think of in England huh? under the leadership of Bloody Mary, as she's called sometimes. Christians being burnt alive at the stake. Huh? There has been terrible persecution. People sawn asunder. All kinds of terrible things happening throughout the history of the church. So you have to understand that the Bible says that persecution may come at any time. <laughs> Great tribulation is a specific period, you know, taught about the end. And uh, just because you'll be raptured out before the Great Tribulation does not mean you get a free pass out of any other persecution that could come. Following me? So what happens in China? They teach like this. Don't worry about any persecution before it hits us will be raptured out. And then the persecution hits them in the 50s and the 60s. Terrible persecution against Christians in China. They go through that, and then this Chinese uh, bishop later comments saying, we did a mistake. We failed our people. When we had a choice whether to prepare them for persecution or give them the comfort that you'll be raptured out, we said, you'll be raptured out, you'll be raptured out. We failed. We should have prepared them for this normal persecution. Can I call it normal? That sounds bad, that sounds wrong. I'm just calling it normal because it's there in various times throughout church history, in various places. I mean, let's be honest. Even facing a little bit of tribulation is hard. For the sake of Christ and for the sake of the gospel, Facing persecution is not easy. Anybody who thinks that's easy and it's a breeze, it's a piece of cake, is totally mistaken. Anybody who thinks that, you know, they can just easily just breeze through it is totally mistaken. Unless you are prepared for it. What do I mean by prepared? The basics, the basics is in Christianity, it always comes back to the basics in life itself. It comes back to the, you've got to have strong faith in Jesus. You've got to have a love for Jesus. Unless your faith is growing, in Jesus, unless your love is growing in Jesus. In other words, if you uh, believe him, believe him more than anyone, and if you love him more than anyone, then if come, somebody comes before you and lays the choice, is it Jesus or this? <laughs> You'll be able to boldly choose Jesus. But if you are, you know, if we say, well, we'll be raptured out before any, see the only people who get hope <laughs> out of uh, this kind of talk is people living in very peaceful environments. I guarantee you go and talk like this to persecuted Christians in the world and say, you know, don't worry, you'll be raptured out before the great tribulation. They're going to say, what do you mean? I'm already in tribulation, man. <laughs> what I'm saying is our application of the rapture, the way we take it and therefore live life by it must be compatible with the way a persecuted Christian also can do it. <laughs> right? So the purpose of rapture is not to escape per persecution, but rather to go and meet the Lord and to be with the Lord. That is the true purpose of rapture. It's not escapist type of mentality. Thank God, you know, 
that if he raptures you before the great tribulation thank god for his kindness thank god for his mercy <laughs> but that doesn't mean we can just say ah oh, we relax and we don't worry about all this no we get mentally ready spiritually ready to face normal persecution there i said it plainly how do you take this <laughs> you don't say oh great tribulation i don't have to worry about it and i'll be gone no you get mentally ready spiritually ready to face normal tribulation because you don't need great tribulation to outdo you <laughs> if you're not prepared you'll be done by you know i mean let's face it living monday to saturday itself has its challenges you know, i bump my toe somewhere that itself is irritating to me there are cases you know so i feel like people sometimes they live in a type of a nest you know they don't look at the broader world and they don't think of the persecuted christians and and they 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 you know no you know see we, we are a pastor in a church and so we we have to deal with different kinds of there are cases where terrible things happen to good people and we can't even explain anything we can't say why it happened <laughs> terrible things how can you face something like that it all comes back down to the basics only your faith in christ your love for christ your knowledge of christ if you keep growing in these things you will be able to face the smallest troubles monday to saturday you will be able to face a greater type of persecution for the sake of christ and his gospel and you will be able to face anything anything and god knows when to rapture his church <laughs> yeah god knows right we don't have to tell him i think what do you think god knows he'll do it at the perfect time we don't have to worry about it we got to keep our eyes on him make sure we are growing in faith in him and love for him in the knowledge of him and focus on the essentials not get distracted by all these other things huh? so that we can live life whether there is persecution or not if there's persecution we choose jesus over everything else if there's no persecution we preach jesus over everything else and we keep going forward let's all stand up god will preserve his people he will never allow us to go through something that uh, we are not able to handle 1 corinthians 10:13 never never don't be scared <laughs> you just keep your eyes on christ you just you know just just pay attention to your spiritual life that's it we don't go into a lazy boy mode we are in growth mode we are in growth mode the idea of being raptured meeting the lord in the air causes us to work more fervently for the lord more fervently for the lord preaching the gospel supporting the preaching of the gospel doing the good deeds that we we were ordained to do and all the while growing in our relationship with god let's pray ask him if you would like to grow in your relationship and grow in your faith in him in your love for him in your knowledge of him if you know him more you'll believe him more and love him more and that's what counts as long as we're doing that we can face life whatever it throws at us persecution no persecution anything father we come to you in jesus name we thank you lord we thank you lord we pray you will lead us in the right direction lord we pray lord you know all things you know the future we don't have to know all things about the future because we know the god who knows the future inside out and we are in your hands and no one can ever pluck us out of your hand you will preserve us whether it is without persecution or through persecution you will preserve us you will preserve us and you will we will meet you or you will raise us up in the end and live with you forever and ever and ever in that new world which you make for us lord we thank you we praise you help us not to be afraid of any of the signs the end time signs but help us to keep our eyes on you lord the god who's completely in control sovereign over all ruling and reigning all good father and the lord jesus christ our dear savior and our shepherd and our high priest and the soon coming king we keep our eyes on you help us lord to live our day to day lives 
in the right way. May the knowledge concerning the end times inspire us to live more for you, Lord. Every day to work and to send our kids to school, educate them and, and to do everything. And yet, live life with one foot raised, always ready to meet you. Thank you, Lord. Lead us, guide us for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.